Hi, and welcome back to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. Thanks for joining us today as we start up again our second season. Here to kick things off for us, I'm super pleased to be joined again by Crisis Group's Africa Director, Comfort Arrow. We take a step back and she speaks to us about how the politics of conflicts and peacemaking are changing and in many ways not changing uh, across the continent and this region in particular as we also take a look at the year ahead. So Comfort, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me on the other side this time, Alan, I see. (laughs) (laughs) This is the this is the fun part of this job. Uh, Last time you put me in the hot seat and this time I get to put you into the hot seat. So thank you for coming on. To get this started, um, actually in January, you will have served as Crisis Group's Africa Director for 10 years. Um, First of all, thank you. Those of us who who work with you know just how much you pour uh, really above and beyond um, into this job. Over those years, I'm curious what's changed in terms of conflicts and peacemaking. Um, thank you very much, Alan. And also, I mean, it's it's I'm working with a fantastic um, team of people who've made my job very pleasurable. What has changed a lot? Some things haven't changed. Some things have remained fundamentally the same. Um, sadly, I think what hasn't changed, Alan, is the causes of conflict. Um, so while the headline has been in recent years on jihadi threats and distracting terms like violent extremism and countering violent extremism, some of the fundamental causes of conflict have not altered. Governance, corruption, you know, instrumentalization of ethnicity for political gain, marginalization of, of ethnic groups. But also what has accompanied you know, that has been, I think, an increase in thirst for democratization on the continent. And we've seen more and more street protests accelerating, youthful protests, um, forcing changes in places that we didn't expect them. So, for example, um, in Ethiopia um, and also in, in, in Sudan. So, so that's one thing I, I would say. I think in the last 10 years, what we've seen is a more assertive Africa Union um, wanting to take leadership, to be respected um, for taking on that heavy burden of peace and security on the continent, especially crises that are of international peace and security. The, the, the Security Council has that mandate, but has often left the African Union to play that role. But in wanting to play that role and in wanting to take, take a, upon a more assertive role, there has also had to be a reality check on the African Union in that it has had to assume greater financial responsibility. So I think that's been another important change. At the same time, conflict resolution and peacekeeping has become uh, more decentralised. I think the most glaring change for me, Alan, um, sort of three quick things, increasing coalition formation. So whether it's the G5, um, Sahel, um, to deal with um, the crisis um, in the Sahelian countries, the multinational joint task force to deal with um, Boko Haram in Lake Chad Basin. I think partly these coalitions have have arisen because of frustration with traditional UN peacekeeping. Another um, change, um, the securitization of peacemaking, very worrying, use of military response um, to respond to crisis, especially in the Sahel, but also in Somalia. And then finally, um, the, the, I think the most significant, most worrying is that peacemaking, um, peacekeeping, um, conflict resolution has become more multi-layered, more multipolar. And we can discuss these later, but these are some of the sort of my initial thoughts in terms of what has changed and what hasn't changed um, on the continent. Yeah, and we'll dive deeper into a lot of that here in a bit. First of all, I wanted to highlight for our listeners, and you can tell us more about it, that Crisis Group this year has really flagged the, the Horn of Africa as a, as a region as a key priority for us. What stands out to you about the, the challenges in this region, in particular in Africa, compared to all the other parts of the continent where we work? It's a good question, Alan, and, and I'm very much guided, I think, to answer this question. I'm, I'm guided by Maruti Mutigo, our Horn of Africa director, who always reminds us every time he's talking about the Horn of Africa, that what distinguishes this region is the absence of a hegemon, or I would prefer to say an anchor state or a or, or natural leading state, um, especially one that is able to stabilise 
the, the region. I think most foreign policy experts that I listen to on the Horn of Africa, um, even my colleagues, um, most of you, might see um, Ethiopia as an anchor state, um, even more so today, given how you know Prime Minister Abiy's own regional activism is changing the shape of things. Though I, I do think that other countries in the region, Kenya, for example, will have a very different view and has a very clear notion of what foreign policy can look like in the Horn of Africa as well. Um, I think another thing that worries me or I think that stands out very much in this region, more than any other region, is the ease in which I think national insecurities of several Horn of Africa countries easily spill over into their neighbouring countries. So I, I think here of the, the way in which Somalia has really um, impacted peace and security in, in, in the region. So that's another. And I think another sort of remarkable difference for, for, for me is the secessionist impulse of the region, which, you know, which I think has marked out the, the Horn of Africa for more instability. Um, I think more than any of the regions that I've worked and lived in, and I've lived in three, Southern Africa, Western, and now East Africa, is its strategic relevance. Just look at the map and where the horn interfaces, you begin to understand its import. So today one can measure the region's importance. 40% of the European Union, for example,'s own um, annual imports pass through the the Bab al Madab um, Straits that connects Africa with the Gulf of Aden, the Red Sea also um, to the importantly strategic um, Indian Ocean. And also, um, it's not lost in any of us, and it's very much been very much the forefront of the work of you and your colleagues in the Horn of Africa, that three interlocking great power conflicts are now playing out, dispute between Saudi Arabia and the Gulf allies on the one hand, and Qatar, the Ravi Reeb, between Egypt, backed by UAE, and in particular in Turkey, and then the US-China competition that overlays that as well. So I think these are the things that, that make it um, stand out from, from, all the, from all the other regions. So when, when Crisis Group started, and I think early on in our work, I imagine the, the advocacy part of Crisis Group's work in some ways seemed more straightforward. The US was the clear superpower um, and the United Nations carried more weight. I think that's fair to say. As you touched on earlier, you know, now Crisis Group finds ourselves addressing not just one major distant power, but, you know, sometimes two, four, sometimes more. If the primacy of American power really is what characterized this, you know, fading bygone era, uh, for better or worse, I'm wondering what you are seeing is starting to take shape as the main markers of this of this new era. Um, have we figured that out yet? Uh, before answering that question, just on your earlier point about you know when Crisis Group you know was created about 25 years ago, you know our, our advocacy and our footprint was very much directed towards Western capitals. You know, you asked me sort of what has what has changed, and certainly the footprint for the Africa program. And I would say for the rest of my other colleagues, but the footprint for the Africa program has certainly changed. We're, we're, we're more and more needing to go to the African Union, more and more needing to go to key African capitals, more and more needing to go to do South-South relationships as well. And that's because of precisely what, what you just said, that the primacy of, African, of American power um, appears to be a bygone era. We have to broaden our advocacy. We have to be relevant to the realities on the ground. And the realities on the ground is that increasingly peacekeeping, peacemaking on the African continent is not just decided at the level of the United Nations, not just decided in Washington or New York, but increasingly is determined, shaped in Abuja, in Kigali, in Kampala, in Pretoria, in Beijing, um, and increasingly in Ankara and in the Gulf regions as well. So I think that it's worth emphasising that, that point. Having said that, I would still say that the US remains relevant, but you're right to say that the, the primacy of the US may be a bygone era. What replaces it, however, is still being worked out. The horn I, I see is certainly a microcosm of the efforts to influence, shape what follows, both on the continent, regionally and internationally. Uh, what we can say for sure is that today is that the Horn is, is relevant to any future international relations structure. Um, and we can see that, you know, in terms of the increasingly transactional approach to conflict management um, in the region, um, states 
um, external and from the region are able to pick and choose of which part of the international system they like and don't like. And I think the other issue that's worth emphasising is that the region, but also the continent, has a multitude of choices that allows it to look east, for example, to China in determining and shaping what the future international system would look like, as well as its traditional partners in, 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 the, in the West as well. So we've seen, as, as you said, African countries increasingly really stepping up to manage crises on the continent. Um, we've been very encouraged recently, for instance, by the African Union, largely through its chair, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa, taking the lead on the Nile waters dispute. Of course, a continent of African solutions for African problems also seems in many ways a, a long way off. Is that what we should be striving for or, or what is missing from that equation? So I, I would say that we're not a long way off from African solutions for African problems. It's very much at the heart of African uh, or a- the African Union's own diplomacy. It's very much that the, fa- the very foundations of, you know, its, its former um, entity, the, the Organization of Africa, for African Union, and very much the cornerstone of, of, of the African Union today. I think, and I understand the history behind it, I understand the symbolism behind it. I understand the ideology behind it. And it's very much about making sure that, that the African view, the, the, the African response is what is centre stage in shaping the response to these crises. However, I also have a problem with the notions of African solutions for Africa problems because it assumes that a number of these countries that are acting in the name or on behalf of the African Union do it without having clear national interests. Also, it assumes that African solutions to Africa problems are less controversial or, or do not have the same problems as external interventions from outside the continent as well. For example, um, you know, we can cite um, Ethiopia's and Kenya's intervention into Somalia in 20, 2006 and 2011. Um, they were both problematic. Um, they were supposed to be stabilising the, the, the country, but they were very much driven by the national impulses of both Ethiopia and Kenya. These were not African solutions to African problems. These were national interests to a problem on, in their, in an, in their neighbourhood. The same can be said about the Central African Republic. Um, we, we talk about African solutions, but Chad, when Chad intervened, it intervened on behalf of Chad and not some notion of African solutions to African problems. The same also vis-a-vis, um, vis-a-vis South Sudan. As you know yourself, Alan, one of the biggest challenges that has confronted us in, in South Sudan um, has been um, the national interest of the neighbouring countries. This, this, this is not African solutions for African problems. These are very clear state-led interests that are trying to carve out, shape the future of a, of a country in the neighbourhood to a particular um, um, worldview that they want. So it's, it's an important mantra. It, it makes sense. It has its usefulness. When, when, if we can find unity, it has its usefulness vis-a-vis the outside world. But when we look closely at intra-Africa diplomacy, at how each individual states act in these, in these countries, this is really much about national interest. And those interests are no different, no controversial, no less problematic than those that come from outside the continent. So a, a big question that's that's looming over uh, a lot of these issues right now on on the continent when you take a longer lens is is the question of of China as a rising power. Can African countries and regions make China a strategic partner on peace and security issues, not just economics and infrastructure? Or or is that still a big open question? Um, I mean, that's a timely and important question. I think, especially, you know, given sort of developments that we're, we're seeing on the continent, Today, it's China's presence it certainly continues to grow. Um, it has had a difficult year this year, particularly in the in the context of of its brand of COVID diplomacy, and it's followed. You know, this year, you know, China followed faced heavy criticism over its treatment, discrimination of of Africans in in mid April. It has also had to manage um, some some heavy backlash. Um, against it about Africa's mountain debt to China. Alan, I don't know if you remember, but um, in October 2018, our colleague, um, Michael Korvik, who 
remains um, unjustly detained in China. He wrote an excellent piece on China's increasingly strategic approach to its peace and security footprint on the continent and Beijing's role in helping to shape conflict resolution. What he tried to show in that article, and I think is still relevant um, today, is that over the past decade, China's role in peace and security has grown rapidly through arms sales, through military cooperation, and through peacekeeping deployment in, on the continent. He also tried to illustrate, and I think, I think it's still relevant today, that China has added a growing military presence, a naval base, for example, in, Japan, in, in Djibouti, um, but also um, troops in UN peacekeeping missions, Mali, for example, um, um, to its long-established um, economic ties on the continent. So at one level, you know, China has stepped up its sort of political influence and diplomatic engagement in the Horn and East Africa, but e increasingly in West Africa too. I think the big question um, is not so much understanding the future trajectory of that um, partnership, which is growing and is going to become more assertive, especially as the US is waning, but is the strategic outlook of African states vis-a-vis -vis China as well, and whether the continent is able um, to ensure that um, its own actions vis-a-vis -vis, um, China play back well in terms of conflict resolution and in making sure that, Africa, that, chi that China steps up its military cooperation to ensure that it responds to those conflicts rather than reinforce incumbent and strengthen African security forces and repressive or authoritarian regimes alone. But the outlook from China is more peaceful. You know, and China is hardly alone in making mistakes. We've seen the Western countries have a long history of, of doing this. But as Beijing's influence grows, I think it's, it's important that we steer it in the direction of nudging African leaders um, to, to play a more constructive role in making sure that it addresses um, um, grievances that underpin instability. Now, on the, the other hand, um, when it comes to the U.S., I think a very common narrative and one that's come up on this podcast is the U.S. not only fading as a, as a power, but you know, withdrawing from, from the continent. When you look around, around the continent, uh, broadly speaking, do you see the U.S. withdrawing or do you just see it you know, narrowing perhaps its priorities? Um, I, I think I'll go with your latter characterization, which I think better describes the reality on the ground. Um, it, it, one can char characterize it also as, you know, a period of ambival ambivalence. So it's more focused on sort of traditional priorities like countering, combating jihadi threats. Um, it's, and it's especially engaged as, 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 as we are seeing in Somalia, um, the Lake Chad Basin, the Sahel, and in, and in Libya also. I've, I've often heard people, and, it, and I've heard it on sort of various episodes in your first series, people have often said that the US doesn't have or doesn't look at Africa strategically. I'd like to offer sort of a, a different sort of take on that, um, mm. which is to say that, that you know, that, that there is something strategic about the US's outlook on the continent, although we may not define it as strategic. For example, um, Secretary of State um, Pompeo's visit earlier this year um, to, to Addis Ababa um, was all about seeking realignment of African countries away from, from China. Um, the US understands the continent worth to China, especially along the, the Indian Ocean. I think also it's, it's worth bearing in mind that there are still some continuities in the US actions on the continent beyond um, countering um, jihadi threat. For example, we haven't necessarily seen the massive cuts in aid that we thought that we were going to see at the beginning of the, of the Trump um, era, and neither have we seen that dramatic pull out from peacekeeping, even if the US is often agitating and wanting to see um, a more sort of streamlined peacekeeping, which we ought not to necessarily disagree with. I think we need to see a more effective, more robust um, um, peacekeeping with clear um, entry, but also clear exit strat um, strategy. And, and in a sense, um, that's been an important debate to, ha to have as well. 
Um, that's uh, those are some very useful points. I think it's a reminder that a lot of this uh, withdrawing narrative, I think, about the U.S. often comes from this sort of peacemaking world, if you will. And in some ways, if priorities have narrowed, in one ways they've narrowed, is the U.S. is perhaps less focused strategically on playing a a uh, peace and security role on the continent. Um, I want to take us back to the horn. First of all, on Sudan, um, I I, I want to talk about Sudan first, because I think in many ways, Sudan really speaks to a lot of these bigger points that we've been talking about. Um, You know, despite the fact that, you know, it was very much an incredible people's revolution that that unseated uh, President Omar al-Bashir and really ushered in this this new government, a lot of what the real, you know, politics uh, of this transition has revolved around has been, in fact, sort of managing the the many outside powers who have gotten involved in this uh, in this transition and inside the country, um, and really the sort of ad hoc coalition that's ended up. Um, in some ways forming and sometimes working together and other times, you know, it looks like working at times at odds or at least have interests that are at odds to each other. So so what have we learned in the Sudan case about what this world looks like when it comes to sort of holding very diverse ad hoc coalitions together? You know, the U.S., Europe, different countries in the Gulf, uh, and then you have the African Union really in charge technically of kind of leading all of it. Can I can I just open by saying um, first that this is a transition of real, of real promise, and you know it it, it remains a, a a challenge, but the chance f- you know to really fulfil democratisation and the democratisation um, agenda that Sudanese have long aspired for, must be at centre stage of everything. If the transition offers real promise, um, know too that it can easily be derailed. Um, in a sense, the country faces a double or even a triple whammy um, dealing with, you know, an economy that's on life support and international attention that is elsewhere fighting the, the pandemic, both globally, but also domestically as well. And also um, the very factors that led to a buildup of g- disenchantment and the ousting of Omar al-Bashir remain very much alive. I think much attention and recognition has been given by the Sudanese to the to the interest of key actors, whether it's the U.S. interests and also the Gulf interest, we understand um, its own national interest around about around the war in Yemen and also I- Iran. So Sudanese themselves understand those interests, but those interests and trying to balance the various imperatives and interests of all the a- external act- actors does not change the harsh and painful realities of human suffering on the ground. Gaining and maintaining international consensus, especially, you know, on the immediate issue of international financial assistance, still remains at the heart of the matter for for Sudan. The lifting of the state-sponsored terrorism, while it is not a magic bullet, it's significantly an important political move that will that that President, that Prime Minister Hamdok badly needs. He needs a crucial win, and those countries that are around it, whether it's in the Gulf, the immediate region. Um, to its north, Egypt, to its south, Ethiopia, further afield in the west, they um, they need to keep their eye on that bigger picture about making sure we, we are able to nurture and hold that transition. Um, we've been very clear, as you know, Alan, in our report, um, in all our reporting since the transition, and we've been very clear in saying that the African Union has a significant political role to play in nurturing and stirring the, di- the, the, the transition into the right direction. And I want to underline political and tied to that political legitimacy more than any other multilateral agency, more than any other actor. Sudan has history, um, Af- the African Union has history in Sudan, a difficult, complicated one where it was perceived at one level as um, wanting to preserve the unity of Sudan in the face of, uh, of the southern part of the country that wanted to secede. It's also been accused of wanting to preserve authoritarian leaders in the form of um, Omar al-Bashir. So yes, it has a complicated and some would say compromising history, but crucially, it stepped up and stepped in and played an important role in helping to deliver the peace deal last August. And it also, in the lead up to delivering that peace, took the important step of suspending Sudan at the right moment um, of its membership following the, the 3rd of June 
um, massacres uh, under the um, watch of the military junta. Today, there is serious. There are concerns about the African Union staying in the room. The AU needs to step in, stay in. It has an important role to play. Um, it is a legitimate political actor, and it can, and it and it. And at a time where we don't see anybody wanting to play the role of guarantor for that piece, it belongs to the African Union. So we're, we're sadly running out of our time with you. Um, I want to quickly touch on two other countries in this region, um, which uh, I'd be extremely remiss to 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 leave out um, in, in talking with you. And the first one is on Somalia, and that's really because you know, in other contexts, Crisis Group has really dived into this question of when and how to talk to jihadis. Um, and of course, we've a crisis group has uh, written on how to negotiate uh, with, with Taliban and was an early advocate for, for that happening. And we've also uh, been uh, advocating such an approach in the Sahel too, in terms of starting to negotiate um, with who we call uh, talking to the bad guys. Um, when it comes to Somalia, what, what are the lessons we can learn from those other examples? Um, I mean, it's a controversial subject. I mean, I, I think the very first um, question we have to ask ourselves is, are there elements within Al-Shabaab that might be open potentially um, to opening lines of communication so that we can begin to have a, a conversation about how to reach a, a set settlement? You know, I think it also has to be handled um, delicately um, and sensitively, given the excessive um, toll of horrific violence um, that Al-Shabaab has committed um, against people of, of, of Somalia. I think what is clear and what we have learned at every turn is that a military solution is not a recipe for peace. Um, you mentioned the Taliban. A lesson from Afghanistan is that one should not underestimate the complexity and the fragility of dialogue. Um, like Afghanistan, I think we need to understand Al-Shabaab's position on a number of critical topics. It's not a monolithic group. I think our colleagues in Asia posed a number of important questions or observations that our analysts um, covering Somalia need to think about, certainly um, including whether the insurgents, its leadership, its fighters, fellow travellers have a coherent political vision for Somalia and whether they are willing they are, they are, they are willing. Um, to come to the table and make compromises. Now, the last place I want to touch on, um, and it's partly because so much has happened uh, since we even went on season break, and that's, of course, Ethiopia. Um, it's the region's giant population-wise, um, and each month its political crises really only seem to to deepen. You know, when, when you look at it, what would you say is the most critical factor for crisis group in terms of keeping Ethiopia's transition moving forward peacefully? You know, Alan, I think it's good that we end with Ethiopia because it promises much. And as several of your, your speakers in Series 1 expressed um, you know, some positive points about it, so the dizzying pace of reforms and the change that Prime Minister Abiy um, has brought through under his his premiership, but as ever, as with all transitions, they they can and do go wrong if they're badly sort of managed. I am very worried about Ethiopia's unity, not just for Ethiopia's sake, but for the entire region. I think there are two factors that are crucial to keeping um, Ethiopia's transition moving forward. First, and most crucially, is Prime Minister Abiy's ability to reach out and to reach consensus with his rivals. It won't be easy. He's battling some very dangerous issues, you know, a transition that is adjusting itself after decades of centralised, you know, authoritarian sort of rule. So you know, there will be tremors, there'll be earthquakes, you know, deep historical grievances, internal communal tensions. But I think the key, you know, as ever, is is how, you know, Prime Minister Abbey is able to sort of bring everybody um together and strike a middle ground um with a, with its sort of key rivals, um, the the, the most difficult, most contentious right now of the rivalry, obviously, is with the Tigrayan leaders, but also his Oromo, Oromo people as well. And he's tried to strike a middle, a middle, a middle ground. Um, and some of his moves um, have have weakened the state, you know, has, has left it um, unstable. But it's why we also proposed last year, and will continue to do so, the idea of some form of a national dialogue to start addressing you know, key questions that are at the centre of grievance, at the centre of the struggle, um, power sharing, devolution and, and, of the, of, and of the territory. I think, too, another critical factor is the key 
the key actors here, the international actors. We tend to fall in love easily with key leaders and see them as 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 the key to 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 change. And the international community needs to think twice about you know how much it throws behind President and Prime Minister Abiy and focus on key institutions of states. The leader leaders leave, institutions stay, and it's important to make sure that we have robust. Um, um, institutions that are able to navigate the very choppy waters of Ethiopia's transition going forward. Thanks, Comfort. Thank you very much for coming on our podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening, and a special thanks to all of our listeners who participated in our survey at the end of Season 1. We really appreciate that. We'll be back in two weeks with our next episode. To learn more about International Crisis Group and our work on the Horn of Africa, visit our website at crisisgroup.org or follow us on Twitter at Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. This episode was produced by Mae Francis.